Hello, and welcome to the COE Lecture Series, brought to you by the University of Georgia College of Education. For this episode, we bring you the first of two talks presented by Dr. Sonia Nieto, Professor Emerita of Language, Literacy, and Culture in the School of Education at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Dr. Nieto is also one of the leading researchers, writers, and teachers in the field of multiculturalism. Her topic for today's talk, Finding Joy in Diverse Backgrounds, The Role of the University. All right, so uh, this evening, I would like to speak with you about finding joy in teaching students of diverse backgrounds. And it's really the role of the university, but primarily I'll be talking about the role of teacher educators um, and also some administrators. So this uh, work that I'm presenting tonight is based on my new book, which will be called Finding Joy in Teaching Students of Diverse Backgrounds, which I need to finish by next Friday. <laughs> So I'm a little, you know, uh, but I'll do it. So uh, I want to, sh to start with some essential questions. My work has concentrated uh, for the past several years on the following question. What does it mean to be an outstanding teacher of students of diverse backgrounds? And to find out, I've interviewed many teachers from around the nation and I've listened to their stories. Uh, about what makes teaching a consequential profession. I've tried to figure out the essential values, dispositions, characteristics, practices of excellent teachers, especially those who work with students who are often dismissed as being unworthy and uneducable. There are many such students in our society and race, ethnicity, native language, social class, unfortunately, often define them negatively in the eyes of others. So building on this question of what makes exceptional teachers of students of diverse backgrounds, I want to speak with you this evening about another essential question, and that is what does it mean to support and prepare teachers so that they can become outstanding teachers for students of diverse backgrounds? Mm -hmm. And I truly believe that all teachers can become that, that it takes uh, a lot of work, it takes great teacher educators, it takes a great university, good programs, and of course mentors when they get out into the field, uh, colleagues who can, you know, as Joe Beth said, who can really inspire and, and nurture them along the way. So specifically though tonight I want to talk about what it means to support and prepare uh, teachers so that they can become those teachers. So to me the answer to this question is as important as the first one. And some might say even more so because the university and teacher educators, uh, you know, this is the first place where pre-service teachers get to reflect on th the significance of their chosen profession. I've looked at the extensive research on the question of what it means to be an outstanding teacher of students of diverse backgrounds, and I can summarize it as follows. To be outstanding teachers of students of diverse backgrounds, it takes these things, a solid general education background, deep knowledge of subject matter, familiarity with numerous pedagogical approaches, strong communication skills, effective organizational skills, all of which, of course, are important, but not enough. And lately, because of No Child Left Behind and Race to the Top and other legislation, we now talk about highly qualified teachers. So what does it mean to be a highly qualified teacher? Unfortunately, that literature hasn't added much, or the legislation hasn't added much to the definition of what I think should be the definition of a highly qualified teacher. You know, the test scores, value added, that is uh, 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 evaluating teachers according to their students' test scores, uh, their GPAs, their certification, and so on. So, you know, all of these seem awfully clinical and even cold to me. And while I think that we can all agree that teachers need some of these things, and certainly some of the first things that I mentioned, I don't think that they're enough. So I would add the following, and this comes from a lot of uh, the work that I've been doing for many years with teachers. A love of students and uh, the subject matter that they teach. 
a love of learning. And I'll give you examples of these things uh, this evening. A passion for social justice, energy, perseverance, humility, a sense of humor, and of course, they have to be angels also. <laughs> so um, this is a tall order for a profession that pays new teachers relatively low salaries, embarrassingly so sometimes, and yet expects them to know everything, to put in long hours, to buy supplies with their own money, to continue their professional development, often on their own time and with their own money, and to be teacher, parent, counselor, nurse, and confidant all in one. But this is what we expect of all good teachers. What makes it different to be teachers of students of diverse backgrounds? Now, in some ways, I think this is a moot question because I think that all students are students of diverse backgrounds in some way. You know, usually, and certainly when I, when I started thinking about this issue, I was thinking about my own uh, history as a teacher and the students who I taught in middle school and later in uh, elementary school were African American and Puerto Rican almost exclusively. And those were the students who I was most concerned about given the you know, dismal rate of, of, the, of schools to educate them. Uh, but you know, I've really come to understand that there's diversity of all kinds, and all students are students of diverse backgrounds in terms of not only race and ethnicity, but language, immigration status, gender, of course, religion, sexual orientation, ability, um, national origin, uh, and other differences. And given current demographics and expectations for the next several uh, decades, in most school systems, students of color are now, or soon will be the majority, but that doesn't mean that all teachers know how to, how to be culturally responsive teachers, even teachers of the same background of their as their students. So what are some of the obstacles to being culturally responsive teachers? So in spite of teachers' good intentions, there are numerous obstacles. Uh, in fact, while over 40% of students in our public schools are other than uh, white, English-speaking, and middle class, in too many cases, prospective teachers are prepared as if they were going to be teaching uh, students of 50 years ago. Most have received little coursework, few relevant readings, and almost no experiences in the kinds of schools that they'll most likely uh, be teaching in, that is, urban schools populated by African American, Latino, Asian American, and American Indian students, as well as students of immigrant backgrounds from every corner, corner of the globe, and many poor students, uh, many of whom do not speak English. I should also mention that I was in school 50 years ago when they were preparing teachers to teach those students who were not like me. I went to school speaking only Spanish. There were no ESL teachers. You know, what they told us was not to speak Spanish in school. They told us to sort of leave our cultural baggage at home. So even then there was a problem. It's not as if this is a new issue. This has been with us for a long time, but now the numbers are becoming very dramatic. So it's very clear that we really need to do something. Another reality is that most teachers, uh, particularly uh, uh, specifically, about 83% are white, monolingual, English-speaking, and middle class. And most importantly, because that shouldn't be held against them, most importantly, they've had little professional or personal experience with students who are different from them. So, in fact, I think that why we need to recruit uh, more people of diverse backgrounds to be teachers, I think that it's everybody's responsibility to be excellent teachers of all students, uh, so that every white teacher needs to be a culturally responsive teacher, like every African American and Latino and every other kind of teacher needs to be culturally responsive to students who are not like them, as well as to students who are like them. On top of that, a number of surveys have found that most new teachers feel unprepared to teach today's students, particularly language minority students and those who have special needs. Even more troubling is the fact that many prospective teachers expect and want to teach in schools such as the ones that they attended as children, that is white middle class schools with English speaking children. 
Yet that's far from what will happen because these are precisely the teachers, the young teachers coming out of our colleges and schools of education today who will be teaching in urban areas and will be teaching students of diverse backgrounds because now it's not only urban. Every uh, urbanized suburb, every small town, every hamlet in our nation is becoming diverse. Every single one. So there's very little that we can say is monocultural anymore. Not that it, it ever was. So what does it take? To be a culturally responsive teacher, in addition to all the critical attributes that I've already mentioned, means to be a sociocultural mediator. That means that it's to learn who your students are, to honor the students rather than uh, their identities, rather than try to erase them, to make connections with families, to have high expectations in spite of the conventional wisdom about their about students' abilities, and to provide a robust curriculum that gives them options in life. So this is Mary Ginley, a former student of mine and a gifted teacher who was actually a Massachusetts Teacher of the Year about 12 or 13 years ago. She taught for, uh, let me see, she taught for 35 years in Massachusetts and retired to Florida where she taught for another seven years. She just retired last year. And she put it best in a journal entry that she wrote for one of my classes many years ago. She said, our responsibility is to meet them where they are and take them someplace else. And I think we would all agree that that's a great definition of what teachers should do. But it's incomplete. If you're going to be a sociocultural mediator, then have them carry who they are along with them. And that little addition makes all the difference in the world. Have them carry who they are along with them. I wish my teachers had known that when I was a kid. But instead, we were told not to speak Spanish. We were made to feel embarrassed about being poor and being Puerto Rican. Um, and so this is one of the best pieces of advice that, uh, that I can give you to help students carry who they are along with them. Um, so, I want to focus on qualities of culturally responsive teachers by focusing on the work that I've done in the book that, I'm, that I've almost finished. Um, uh, what I did was to um, interview about 23 teachers around the country. Whenever I would go speak, like here, uh, but it didn't happen here because I hadn't started writing that book when I came here last time. I would ask people if they would recommend a teacher who was thriving, because that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to write a book about thriving teachers. And the more I interviewed teachers, the more I realized not only were they thriving, but they also were finding joy in teaching students of diverse backgrounds. And those are the teachers who I wanted to find out about, because they can be a source of great inspiration, I think, for many other teachers and for the teaching profession. So um, these are some of the, the, uh, the traits, the characteristics of these culturally responsive teachers. They value language and culture. They insist on high quality and excellent work from all students. They honor families. They exemplify commitment to lifelong learning and they engage in critical self-reflection. So for the rest of my talk today, what I'd like to do is uh, give you examples from the teachers who I interviewed, from some of the teachers I've just selected Six, I think, for these five things. So first, valuing language and culture. For culturally responsive teachers, uh, the students' personal backgrounds and their voices are a rich resource for the curriculum. Rather than uh, you know, get rid of them or hide them, they are a source for the curriculum. So it's not simply because it makes students feel good. You know, this is not just about having a feel-good curriculum but because their language and culture are valuable in their own right, something that they don't always get to hear. Of course, every teacher uses culture in all of their lessons too. Every teacher does, we all do in everything that we do. But if you're from the majority culture, you might be unaware that you're using these cultural references. It's like the fish in the fishbowl that's in the water but may be unaware of that fact because that's simply its environment. 
the difference with cultural responsive teaching is that this kind of teaching is done with students whose language and culture are often invisible in the curriculum. It's purposeful and it's done with specific goals in mind to affirm students uh, who, who, to affirm who students are in order to have them connect with school and accept and relish who they are and succeed academically. And there should be no uh, contradiction there. So this is Maricela Mesa. She's one of the teachers who I interviewed. She's an elementary bilingual teacher in Los Angeles. And one day I, I, I had asked the person who invited me to Loyola Marymount University a couple of years ago uh, if she could highlight one teacher who was thriving and who was doing well with students of diverse backgrounds. And she said, no, I can't possibly do that. I said, why? And she said, because I have too many of them. I can't just give you one. So we ended up having uh, a group interview, sort of a focus group with uh, about eight teachers. And she was one of them. She's also one of the youngest teachers I interviewed for, for the entire book. And she's a good example of, her, of how her own experience as an immigrant helped her become a culturally responsive teacher. Arriving in the United States from Mexico as a fluent Spanish speaker, but speaking no English, she had the desire to succeed in her new country with a new language. But she didn't have either the linguistic or the material resources at home that would help her. In other words, her family was poor, they uh, didn't have a formal education, and they didn't speak English. Like so many of our students. You know, so many of our students. Um, so for her, it was teachers who gave her, she said, a helping hand that allowed me to be myself and be successful. You see, Juxtaposing those two things is so important, to be myself and be successful, rather than to make a choice. You know, if, if, if I am me, does that mean that I'm going to fail? She said, I owe many of my successes to those teachers who took some time out of their regular day to provide that support that I couldn't find at home due to the limited English skills at home. But I think just that passion that I was able to get from those teachers just doing it voluntarily, just because they wanted to help, not because there was any compensation. I feel that I am who I am because I retain my native language and because of those teachers who were there, dedicated, who always cared about what, was going, what I was going to become. So I hope I can become that teacher, not just for one student, but for every student that takes part in my classroom. And that was her inspiration for becoming a teacher. But what about teachers who don't share their students' language and culture? Can they also become that teacher for their students? The answer is not only that they can, but that they must. It is possible to become that teacher, but it takes the will and humility to learn who their students are and to respect their identities. Here's an example from Amber Bouchard. She's a middle school language arts teacher in Plainfield, Illinois. She had been a kindergarten teacher in an elite private school in Massachusetts. So look at that difference. Elite private school in Massachusetts, a, uh, a sort of urbanized suburb of Chicago teaching middle school language arts. And when I said to her, wasn't the transition difficult for you? And she said, I love the process of teaching and learning. So it doesn't matter what level I teach. So anyway, she had been this, uh, a wonderful teacher, a kindergarten teacher in this private school in Massachusetts when she appeared at my door one day pleading with me to allow her into my oversubscribed uh, uh, course in multicultural curriculum development. She needed it, she said, and this must have been about 12 years ago, because her husband's company had uh, relocated him to Chicago and she knew she'd be teaching students of diverse backgrounds and she didn't know where to begin. So, of course, I let her in the class. She was an excellent student, and she's an exceptional teacher, whether she's teaching kindergarten uh, or language arts uh, in this very diverse middle school that, to give you a sense of the diversity, it has 32 languages represented in that school. What she didn't realize at the time, but uh, that she soon learned, was that it wasn't only teachers working in urban areas who needed multicultural education but all teachers working with all kinds of students. She became not just knowledgeable about multicultural education, 
but also an extraordinarily enthusiastic proponent of its value for all students, regardless of background, having since completed a doctorate in multicultural education. She is still in the classroom. Um, and Amber put this philosophy into practice immediately when she was still in Massachusetts in her kindergarten class. And she said, when I interviewed her, I interviewed her when I was in Chicago a couple of years ago, she said it was really relevant in my all-white kindergarten class. I remember doing this color study where I had the kids paint the color of their skin. They were making little quilt pictures of themselves and they had to mix paint colors and they started talking about, you know, we're not really all the same color, are we? We're all different colors of white. The course in multicultural education exposed her, she said, to this concept of affirming each person where they are and who they are and getting to know students as individuals and families as individuals and bringing these conversations up in the classroom. In her new urbanized suburb of Plainfield and armed with her new knowledge and having begun to speak with her students, colleagues, and families about issues of privilege and diversity, uh, Amber felt ready to tackle the issues at her new school. She talked about how in the course she had taken with me, we discussed issues of race, power, privilege, and difference, and it was revealing to her. And this is what she said. I just needed someone to say, you don't have to be black to do this. So now I'm telling all of you, you don't have to be black to do this. You have to be who you are to do this. And in fact, you must do it to affirm all students of all backgrounds. I needed you to say, it's okay if you don't know it. It's okay for me that I grew up in a relatively privileged life or that I might have experienced, I didn't realize it at the time, but I might have experienced poverty. She is one, uh, one of 12 children. And so she didn't really, she didn't really think about poverty, you know. Uh, she thought she was privileged. Being willing to talk about our differences and value our differences is very, very important. Being comfortable enough to do that is very important. She's a teacher who wants to know everything that she can about her students. She wants to be able to learn about them by finding out who they are, what's important to them, and where they want to go. She wants to find out, she said, what do you dream? What do you want to learn? And she had some wonderful anecdotes about working with kids who had sort of, in middle school already, given up on learning, and how she was able to work with them very productively. So what can teacher educators do? They can, of course, provide meaningful courses, not courses that help perpetuate stereotypes and get teachers off the hook, because we have a lot of that of, well, these poor kids, they live in poverty. You know, in Spanish we call it the Ay bendito syndrome, which is like, oh, poor things, you know, they can't do much, they don't even have pencils, you know. Um, and so those kinds of, of messages are really detrimental, I think, for, for teachers getting into uh, the profession. And not only methods courses that give often one-size-fits-all answers. In fact, I've been known to say recently that I don't think we should have methods courses. I think we should have courses that teach prospective teachers how to work with families. Yeah, what Joe Beth teaches, right? We should have uh, courses that teach students about the history of education in our country because most people don't know that and that's really important. That, you know, inequality is not something new. Uh, that we should have courses that focus on the socio-political context of education so, so teachers know, you know, uh, about structural inequality. Uh, and know about racism, and know about other obstacles that get in the way. So courses that help teachers and prospective teachers learn how to engage with their students and with their families, and that explain how macro and micro policies and practices sustain inequality. To demonstrate support for diversity of all kinds throughout the teacher education program, um, so meaning having policies and practices that recruit, retain, and support underserved students into the teaching profession, and hire and promote faculty and staff to, of diverse backgrounds in all specializations, not just multicultural education and bilingual education. I've met too many people who have said to me, who are 
uh, African-American or Latino particularly, who said, you know, I never studied. I never studied multicultural education, and here I am teaching the course, because they looked at me and said, oh, you can teach this course. So, um, you know, uh, faculty of diverse backgrounds have to be teaching everything. Okay, insisting on high quality work. When teachers insist on high quality work from their students, it's an indisputable message that they care about them. And that's what students say when you ask them. Yeah, she's strict, but boy, I know that she really cares about me because she makes sure that I do my homework. Um, it's this combination of high standards and caring that's too often missing from the standards movement, an important lesson we can learn from Jeffrey Winokur. Jeffrey teaches at the Parkway Northwest High School for Peace and Social Justice in Philadelphia, where almost all his students are African American, with some Afro-Caribbean, Latino, and a few biracial students in the mix. He teaches uh, English and humanities courses, as well as a course called Leadership and Social Development. And he has a special interest in African literature and film, so he's incorporated these interests into his courses, most of which are interdisciplinary in nature. Luckily, he has the freedom to do that at that school. He's a demanding teacher. He never uses textbooks. He says the students breathe a sigh of relief when he tells them this. But instead, he selects books that can be read at both the high school and college levels and has even taught graduate level books to his 11th and 12th graders. Now, these are African-American, primarily students from Philadelphia. And a lot of people wouldn't have these expectations of them. He said that he can only remember three or four st students in the, I think he's been there 11 years, who have not graduated. So that's a pretty amazing thing as well. So he says, with these very demanding books, he says, to me, they can do it. It's just giving them the context, allowing them a context in which they can do things that they can do. And he continues, he says, then when I tell them that I'm going to teach them how to read these books, that I'm going to teach them how to read them, not just that we're going to read them, I think that they like that. I think that when they're allowed to talk and express themselves, I think they really like that. At the same time, Jeffrey is close to his students. He's the kind of teacher defined by researchers Jacqueline Irvine and uh, James Frazier as warm demanders. I love that term, warm demanders. That is, teachers who are unrelenting in their demands while also being nurturing and loving. So this quote of Jeffrey's really sums it up well, I think. He says, I feel like my relationship, I will say I feel like it has to be based on love, really. What that means is sometimes very joyful and sometimes not. I try to, as much as I can, I try to think of them like how would I treat them if they were my own kids, which means sometimes they need a hug and sometimes they need a knock upside the head, so to speak. And so I really try to develop an individual relationship with each kid. So what can teacher educators do? The first is to trust teachers. Involve classroom teachers in in your, I don't know if you do that, you probably do. You have clinical faculty who come in and, and teach, um, in teaching courses, supervising students, and helping define the curriculum. Um, provide students and preservative teachers with some autonomy to experiment, create, and collaborate in their courses. I don't think that anybody should graduate as a teacher without knowing how to collaborate with others. Uh, that, to me, is absolutely essential, because if you don't have that, Teachers will continue to think that teaching is only an individual endeavor, and it isn't. When I was working with some teachers in Boston, we had an inquiry group, and I would meet with them once a month. I would drive out to Boston, meet with them once a month. And, and they each had their own classrooms, of course. And they, in fact, they were in all different schools from around the city. But one of the teachers, at the end of our... Uh, semester of working together, she said, now when I walk into my classroom, I walk in with the voices of all the other teachers in my head. And that's what collaboration means as well, that you learn from others, that you have a shoulder to cry on, or you can pat someone on the back, or you have questions about your own teaching, and you can, you know, find out about it. So that 
it's, it's really important, I think, to teach pre-service teachers to experiment and to collaborate and to push the envelope because that's another question that I get a lot from pre-service teachers who say, well, look, there's so many demands right now. There, you know, we have to teach to the test. We have to, we have all of these, uh, um, you know, uh, curriculum that's, that's required and so on. And I always say, yes, but you can always push the envelope a little bit. You can always do things that are creative, even within those structures. And finally, help students understand that standards don't necessarily require standardization. Uh, one of the teachers who I mentioned said, you know, any teacher worth his weight has standards. We have standards. We just don't like this. He called this behavioristic mill, behavioristic mill of standardization, which I think is a beautiful way to put it. Okay, honoring families. This is Griselda Benitez. And, uh, you know, I don't think that most teacher education uh, programs still include courses that teach prospective teachers even how to talk with families, with family members, with parents, um, or creative ways of communicating with them, or how to involve families in the school, how to find out about the funds of knowledge that all families have. So stubborn stereotypes such as, you know, families don't care about education, uh, that because they're poor, they couldn't possibly help in any way. All of these stereotypes, um, you know, are perpetuated because I think teachers often are afraid to engage with parents because they don't know how to talk with them. And especially if they're of a different background. They're afraid they're going to be stepping on toes. And, you know, I always say, if you step on toes, say I'm sorry, and then go on. But it doesn't mean that you, can't, that you shouldn't try to engage with the families. And I remember when, uh, when I was at UMass and teaching a course where Ruth was, actually, where's Ruth? There she is. Do you, I don't know if you remember that teacher, Ruth, who said, remember, they, they, they had a project to write a book with their students and their students' families. That was their project for the semester, and it, was, it turned out beautifully. But some of the teachers who had been in that school for years had never stepped foot in the community. They really didn't know the families. They would drive in, teach, drive home, and never see the community. The community was primarily Puerto Rican, although there was some, uh, there was some immigrant students coming in from Africa, and, and there were other students of other backgrounds as well, and some white students and African-American students. Uh, and there was a teacher who said, well, you know, I just can't get the teachers to respond. I want to write this book with the kids about she had a wonderful idea to write a book about teachers, uh, where parents told their children what their first day of school had been like when they were kids. A lovely idea. She said, but the teachers haven't responded. Only four of the, uh, the parents haven't responded. Only four parents have responded. And so then she said that one, that her uh, paraprofessional, who was Puerto Rican, said, should I write the letter in Spanish? And Oh, good idea. And she got seven more parents. Then the para said, maybe I should call them. And they got almost all the parents, and the book that they made was beautiful. But it has to go from the paraprofessional to the teacher as well, that they think of these things. So, you know, the thing about honoring families, I don't think that you can really be an effective teacher of students of diverse backgrounds until you engage with families. So um, sometimes, especially in the case of immigrant families, and that's, this is especially true, or it's exacerbated with families who are here illegally, they may not know that they're expected to be involved in school, and even if they do know, they may feel nervous, embarrassed, or disrespected if they show up. Nobody, nobody speaks the language, nobody looks at them. You know, I've heard too many parents say, well, I walked into that school and they didn't even look at me. And it's the secretaries, you know, who are often wonderful, but, you know, just, uh, just so frazzled themselves. But somebody has to be there to look at them and to welcome them. So family means many things to culturally responsive teachers. It means regularly communicating with, uh, with the students, respecting and admiring the families 
uh, learning from them. It also means creating a sense of family in their classroom. So in, a, in addition to honoring students' language and culture, the teachers I interviewed at Loyola Marymount University, uh, and Griselda was one of them, insists that all families and communities have strengths. Rather than viewing their students' families as uneducated and disinterested in education, they recognize that education is a strong value in the Latino community where they teach because immigrant families understand only too well that education is the only way, the only possible way that their children may have a chance at a better life than their own. So for Griselda Benitez, who teaches uh, in Winter Gardens, uh, California, uh, establishing relationships with students is a matter of building trust with families as well. She does so by making sure to have activities such as community circle, something that had been a regular part of the school day in her previous school, but that isn't prevalent at her current school. So most people don't do it, but she keeps doing it, she said, because it's a time when students share their feelings and also let her know what's going on with their lives and in their communities. It was the community circle, for, uh, for instance, that she found out that the father of one of the students had been deported, something that she might not otherwise have found out. Not only does she benefit as a teacher from community circle by learning more about her students and their families, but the students also benefit because they learn to listen, they get to know one another more deeply and to empathize. Uh, as a result of finding out about this parent, this father who had been deported, the teachers and students were able to contact the family and offer support, something that was no doubt incredibly significant for a family that had just lost its father and husband. So what can teacher educators and universities do? I think make the curriculum family friendly, that is offer courses that focus on families and on funds of knowledge, encourage prospective teachers to learn how to do home visits and other regular communication with families. Whether, you know, and if you're a high school teacher or a middle school teacher, that's, that's hard of course, but there are things that you can do. My husband was a high school teacher and he would send a, this is when we just had Xerox machines, he would send a Xerox letter home every week to the families. And, in, and, and don't think that the families didn't appreciate it and that his 16 and 17 and 18 year old students didn't appreciate it. They loved it because they'd see their names in some of those letters. He'd make sure that he would include some names each week so that the students would know that they were, you know, they, that they were included. Um, encourage prospective teachers to take relevant courses also, and this is what the university can do, in history and culture and other areas. Otherwise, how are they to know where the students are coming from? You know, if you don't know, well, history of education, of course, but also just the history of the United States, you know, why is it that Mexican Americans, for example, uh, say that a great part of the United States was actually theirs? It was, you know, and yet a lot of people don't know that. A lot of people don't know that, you know. Why is it that uh, more Puerto Ricans live in the United States now than in Puerto Rico? Why is that? Puerto Rico is virtually a colony of the United States, but most people don't know that. And yet we have all, we have four million people here, right, or four and a half million. Uh, and so it's important to know our history. It's very important to know our history. A commitment to lifelong learning, and this is John Wynne. Learning is a really indispensable part of being a teacher. So this means redefining teaching as an intellectual activity and teachers as intellectuals. And that's far from how teachers are currently viewed in most cases. John was inspired by his grandfather who was a chemistry teacher in Vietnam. So he decided in eighth grade, when he was already here, his family had moved here, that he too wanted to be a teacher. By this time, he and his family had arrived in the United States and were living in Danbury, Connecticut. When I interviewed him, he had been teaching civics and social studies for 11 years in New Haven, Connecticut, the last eight years at James Hill House High School. With about 900 students, Hill House has a population that is about 80% African American, 19% Latino, and 1% quote other, which I assume is white. It's one of only two schools in the city not designated as a magnet school, so 
as a result, by default, it's, it's a default choice for most um, of the students who don't go to magnet schools. John said, if you don't get into all the other schools, you sort of indirectly come to our school. So it's not a school of choice for a lot of kids. Uh, at the beginning of his time at Hill House, John was severely tested by his students. Some of his classes were extremely large, although by city law they were supposed to have no more than 20 students. One had 55 students. There were also discipline problems, and he recalled that he was called awful things, too. That isn't the case anymore. John has close relationships with his students, and he's an excellent and award-winning teacher. That's how I met him. He won uh, the Milken Award, among other awards. Only, they only give two in, this, in each state uh, a year. Uh, he's a fabulous teacher, and part of the reason that he's a fabulous teacher is not only that he cares for his students and cares about them, but that he sees himself as a lifelong learner. Uh, it should be noted also that in spite of the difficulties that he had, John had purposely chosen to teach in New Haven precisely because of the diversity. He didn't, he said, want to teach in a homogeneous school like most of Connecticut, although, as he said when he laughed when I was interviewing, he said his school is almost homogeneous African-American. Still, this was the environment that he wanted to work in because, as he explained, quote, I wanted an area where I could make a lot of impact and change, preferring, he said, to teach the students for the most part that have been neglected. John is an incredibly enthusiastic learner. He set about learning to be a teacher at the improbable age of 13, when he was in eighth grade and he decided to be a teacher. He began by immersing himself in the kinds of learning experience he knew would serve him well as a teacher. It's incredible that a 13-year-old has this kind of, you know, foresight. It was the summer of the Tiananmen, Tiananmen Square uprising, and shortly thereafter, the Berlin Wall came down. These were eye-opening uh, events for John, and he said, it's one of the first times I realized there's a world outside of Connecticut, and they're fighting for what I took for granted, which was democracy. He continued his self-education in high school and through college at the University of Connecticut. Years later, John went to both China and Germany, sites of the Tiananmen Square and, uh, the, and the Wall, visits that have strengthened his teaching. When he was in high school and completely on his own, John volunteered for the AIDS Quilt Project in Connecticut. He was the only high school student to do so. Continuing his community service learning in high school, he volunteered for both Habitat for Humanity and Amnesty International. During college, he took a year off to join AmeriCorps, which upset his parents greatly because they were afraid he wouldn't return to school. But as he said when I interviewed him, I wanted to be a teacher, so of course I was going to go back to school. During his year with AmeriCorps, John worked on cleaning up the floods in New Orleans, setting up a teen center in Baltimore, and releasing fish in the streams of New England. Because of his work with AmeriCorps, he and his peers were invited to the White House on two occasions. He said, I knew that all those experiences would make me a better teacher. Still thinking of himself as a student, John continues to learn all he can to bring knowledge back to his students. He believes strongly that learning is a lifelong journey and that it can happen anywhere. He said his best years in college, quote, were the ones away from it. He received academic credit, for example, for doing an internship with the National Council for the Social Studies in Washington, D.C. while he was in college, and for going to Vietnam with his geography professor. He also studied in London, afterwards traveling through Europe for several months. Even then, teaching was in the forefront of his mind. He said, I knew that wherever I went, I was going to teach, and I just learned as much as I could to bring it back into the classroom. When John was already a teacher and five months after Hurricane Katrina devastated the Gulf, he went to New Orleans during his February break to work with Habitat for Humanity. After his week in New Orleans, he created a PowerPoint presentation for his students. As he said, this was another example when I encouraged my students to continue to grow as people in order to become not only better students, but more importantly, better people. So that's John. You see why I'm inspired by these teachers. They're really incredible. But they're not unusual. You know, and that's the point that I want to make also, because I think all teachers can be these teachers or like these teachers. 
When, um, okay, so what can universities do? I think that universities can create academically challenging learning opportunities, both curricular and extracurricular, uh, throughout the university. Um, and they can provide students with opportunities to become better people, as John said, through school and community-related activities. Okay, engaging in critical self-reflection. Culturally responsive teachers realize that before they can create a learner-centered cur curriculum, they need to figure out who they are and where and how they fit in to the picture. This means critical self-reflection about sometimes difficult issues. This is Roger Wallace, <clears throat> who exemplifies what it means to reflect critically. Roger is, was a veteran teacher. He was the only African-American male teacher in his school for 39 years, retiring last year. He hadn't originally planned to become a teacher, but instead a juvenile justice lawyer. He'd always loved working with kids, and he did well in his law boards and gained admission to the University of Virginia Law School. But he abandoned the idea of law after he became hooked on teaching in his senior year in college when he had an inter internship in an after-school program in the city of Worcester, Massachusetts. He found the work so rewarding that he thought, where can I work with a body of kids before they get into a great deal of trouble? And he decided that it had to be in a school. So immediately after graduating, he became a teacher. He believes there's no greater calling than teaching. And as a black man, he says that he has certain responsibilities. Part of his cultural legacy, he says, is to accept children for who they are rather than what he or anyone else expects them to be. He explained, for instance, that some white teachers expect children of color to be just like the white kids. He said, look, it ain't going to work. They ain't never going to be white. Can you teach them as they are instead of I'll teach them when they become what I want them to be and then they'll be ready to learn? They're ready to learn. They need to learn now. So Roger gave this piece of advice to teachers and prospective teachers. So if you want to be a successful teacher of kids of diverse backgrounds, put your stuff away. Putting your stuff away is one of the wisest pieces of advice I heard in the interviews that I've done with the teachers. Putting your stuff away is about listening to students and their families, learning from them, and discarding any negative preconceptions, biases, and untested assumptions about them. Recognizing that everyone harbors biases, Roger nevertheless encourages teachers to walk into a classroom with fresh eyes and an open heart. Uh, I'll just share a little, a little uh, anecdote with you. When he was saying that he connects with, with parents all the time, because he's a, he was a sixth grade teacher, because he realized that that's the only way to really also you know, work with the kids. So he said that uh, he believes in, in having uh, conferences, teacher-parent conferences, anywhere parents want to have them. For example, in a laundromat. So, so if I know that a particular parent goes to the laundromat on Thursday, I'll be there, willing to fold all the clothes except the underwear. <laughs> so what can universities do? Provide meaningful coursework, again, and extracurricular activities. And also, in the different courses and the different activities, uh, encourage those courageous conversations, or what Marilyn Cochran Smith calls hard talk about difficult issues of race and gender and privilege. Um, so those are the things that, that universities can do. But let me end with a caveat. And these are some of the, all, all the things that I've talked about. Let me end with a caveat. We need to acknowledge that no one teacher, no one school, no one teacher education program, no one university can do it alone. We're living in a time when teachers are blamed for everything, from student test scores to greed, of all things. Uh, and when teacher bashing has become a national pastime, although there, there, we have seen a brief respite from it since the, hand, the Sandy Hook Elementary School, uh, teachers' heroism became apparent. Our society, though, remains harshly unequal. Um, 
providing few resources to the students who need them most and blaming students, families, and teachers for the failure of our public education system rather than blaming the structural inequality, poverty, and racism that are really at the root of the problem. Um, so we'll continue to have what is called the achievement gap until we do something about it. But I don't like that term. I prefer to call it the resource gap or the opportunity gap or the caring gap, because uh, I think that those are much more appropriate terms. But until we demonstrate that we care for all of our students, that we, uh, until we honor teaching as the noble profession that it is, even such exemplary teachers as the ones that I've highlighted this evening will have a hard time of it. This means making substantive change beyond the classroom and the school and demanding that our entire society, including our cities and towns, and, uh, and, and the federal government also changed their policies and practices. Because if we truly care about public education, if we believe that all students deserve the chance to dream, if we're honest about the United States being the land of opportunity, uh, we have to do better. We can start by learning from teachers such as those that I've spoken with you about today. In this era of high stakes testing and rigid accountability, they remind us that some things simply cannot be measured. It's my hope that those of you who are teacher educators and higher education administrators will heed their voices and their lessons. Thank you very much.